Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another session of the Friday Seminar Series. So on behalf of the University of Queensland and the Sustainable Minerals Institute, we'd first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet today, the Turbul and Jagarov people, and pay our respects to their ancestors and descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. So it's my great pleasure today to welcome uh, Dr. Bianca Foggiato. Bianca has more than 17 years of experience in metallurgical and process engineering. She completed her PhD degree here at the University of Queensland, specialising in modelling and the simulation of processing circuits, combination circuit design, optimization, and energy efficiency. Now, as the technical director in combination and processing, Bianca works in collaboration with the staff teams at Osenko's global offices to support the activities related to the design of minerals processing circuits, all while ensuring high quality services are delivered ac across all offices. So please welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming Bianca. Hello everybody. It's a pleasure to be back to the JK after quite a few years. Um, today, I'm gonna be talking about the design of fine grinding circuits in an ESG context. Um, the, the agenda of this presentation will include uh, a brief introduction and acknowledgement. Then I'll go through the key takeaways so I don't keep you guys curious about what I'm going to talk today. And then I will go through some uh, specifics related to test work, uh, the circuit design itself, the carbon emissions uh, in uh, third milling circuit operation, and I uh, will illustrate that with a case study. So I guess everybody here knows that uh, third milling technologies is extensively used in fine grinder duties, and that's because it can deliver energy efficiency, a higher in energy efficiency than bowl mills, particularly when you're targeting grind sizes below 75 micron. And the reason for that is that uh, stirred mills will normally use smaller media sizes than bowl mills. Uh, the modes of breakage is different, uh, favoring the generation of fines. And it also has uh, higher volumetric utilization and energy int intensity. Additional to that, uh, typically stirred mill circuits um, require lower concrete uh, quantities, uh, so there is a benefit in terms, there can be a benefit in, in terms of uh, the footprint as well. And uh, uh, it can produce narrower particle size distributions, which can deliver benefits downstream. Recent developments in um, third mill design uh, is uh, leading to larger mill shells, higher installed uh, power per unit, and also more recently, the ability to process coarser meal feeds. So the work that I'm gonna present here today is uh, based on uh, a number of um, uh, published uh, publications that uh, we have been uh, doing the past few years in Osenko. As you see there, um, we see five different publications, one of them uh, ongoing work and which you can see some familiar names from the JK, like Rajiv and, and Grant, but you can also see that uh, uh, a wide group of uh, engineers are involved from undergraduates uh, to lead engineers. So um, it's a very um, collaborative uh, work with uh, teams around the globe. So what are the key takeaways of my presentation today? Uh, as I mentioned before, innovative flow sheets are now considering the use of stirred mills, particularly because they are adapting these mills to accept uh, uh, coarse uh, feeds, coarser feeds, than uh, that from regrind circuits to deliver higher or uh, higher energy efficiency than a bowl mill in this type of duty. It's really important uh, that uh, we understand what is. Uh, what course means, like what is the, the feed size that will be fed to that circuit, how you're gonna operate your mill, uh, particularly in terms of the pulp density, because sometimes viscosity can be an issue in third milling applications. And of course the media size uh, that is uh, 
adequate for that feed. So uh, when analyzing uh, test work results to design those circuits, uh, there is uh, often an issue with misalignment uh, of results from different tests. And further work is needed in this area because um, many issues are, uh, can happen. It could be related to sample quantity because you cannot generate the amount of sample required for a representative test. It could be related to the test methods that is used, the media size and slurry density, as I mentioned before, or it could be a peculiarity of the feed, such as uh, a truncated feed that we see for coarse particle flotation uh, circuits. And lastly, the main benefits of stirred milling in an ESG context. Of course, as we know, it can deliver lower energy and media consumption, but it can also result in reduced uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So first let's go through um, uh, stirred milling test work. So there is a not uh, generally accepted methodology uh, to determine the energy efficiency of fine grinding duties. The typical bone, bone mill test uh, is difficult to apply because of the nature of the samples and the limitations of the test. Uh, when um, truncated feeds or when uh, fine feeds are from flotation circuits are uh, submitted to the bone test, um, it doesn't follow the rule of the test that uh, the feed and product needs to follow a uh, similar slope in log-log space so that you can use a single P80 marker um, as your reference point. So uh, to address this issue, Vendors uh, have developed over the years uh, test work procedures and methodologies uh, specific to their mills um, to, to be able to estimate the full scale mill performance. On the right side there, I'm showing a few different uh, tests that are available uh, in the industry. So there is the alternative leveling test, which is a modified bond mill test uh, specific for finer grinding um, targets. Uh, Mento Autotech uses uh, the jar mill test, which is a batch test as well. And other vendors uh, use uh, continuous or semi-continuous uh, setups, uh, which is shown in the middle photos there. And in the bottom, I'm showing um, uh, hot from the press uh, uh, VPM uh, circuit uh, where um, that uh, mill is designed for coarser duty applications. The mill has a different design with a length diameter, height diameter relationship, a different height diameter relationship, uh, the media size and the spacing of uh, the disks. <clears throat> so most, uh, most vendors consider a similar process parameter and, and, and set points that they vary. Uh, so based on the, the, the feed uh, size and the specific gravity of the material, as well as um, the target grind size, uh, vendors will select uh, what media size distribution is suitable for uh, that application. And we'll also select a slurry density that will likely not cause viscosity issues and uh, delivered um, biased results. So because the vendors don't, uh, uh, don't normally use exactly the same parameters uh, for their tests, there is a challenge in interpreting the test work results and, and compare the technologies. So recently in uh, personal communications with Glencore, they've indicated that um, um, they, some of the estimates uh, that they've seen recently uh, in the industry result in uh, significant lower uh, energy requirements than uh, typical operations. I'm going to show a few examples of projects that I worked on where I observed this kind of issue. So the first uh, example here is a secondary grinding uh, application. So we took two samples and run uh, both uh, HIG mill and ISO mill tests. As um, you can see on the left graph, um, the curves, uh, the signature plots obtained for both Isomil and Higmil are very parallel in log-log space. 
but the Higmill test uh, results in a much lower energy requirement. To the right side, uh, you can see the size specific um, the size specific graph, uh, which is uh, the energy required to generate uh, in this case minus thirty five micron material, and we can see that at least between tests they are pretty consistent. A second example here is uh, for a rougher flotation concentrate. And in this case, uh, we used uh, three different technologies, the isomil, the Higmill, and the Germil test. Uh, to plot this graph, um, I used a, a MO scale-up factor of 0.65, which is a factor that they typically apply for uh, regrind duties. Uh, but as we can see, the corrected value of the Germil test, which is the bottom line here, results in, in, in an even uh, lower specific energy than it would uh, with the Higmill, which is the two middle lines here. And um, again, the isomil resulting in the more conservative result. So one, one important thing uh, when analyzing the Germil test is understanding how, how to come up with this uh, scale-up factor uh, what is the basis? Uh, how do you determine it? Um, so it's uh, something that uh, uh, we are also always look, discussing with Metal when we look at these type of tests um, and, and raises a concern when comparing it with other methodologies. The third example, again, another flotation concentrate. Um, in this case, uh, we run Higmill and Isomil test again. And once again, the um, uh, Isomil test resulted in a, in a higher uh, specific energy. But as you can see in this, in this case, uh, the curves are not exactly parallel. And uh, the beginning of the Higmill test uh, resulted in a different slope uh, of a curve, which suggests there was uh, possibly some issues uh, such as uh, viscosity issues that was uh, changing that slope of that curve. So there are a few other considerations that we look at uh, when analyzing uh, parallel tests. And one of them is the sample mass. Some vendors uh, require much less mass than others. And uh, it, it, it can result in a, in a bias because uh, typically one needs a, at least three or four times the mill voltage volume uh, to achieve a steady state uh, in, in the test. The other thing we need to consider is the technology itself, the mill orientation and, and the grinding internal design, which could potentially be leading for different energy efficiency. And as I mentioned, viscosity issues is something that is very common in this type of test. So we need to um, <clears throat> understand what happened physically during the test uh, to uh, figure out uh, uh, what was happening and how to compare the results. So in a single, uh, we have identified this issue uh, of uh, uh, inconsistent results. And we started an initiative um, to analyze a parallel test work results. So Julian Thompson is an undergrad from UQ who has been uh, helping us uh, with uh, this initiative. And he's trying to identify a unique method that allows a uh, proper interpretation of the results. So different methods are being used. So uh, the two typical ones, which is what I showed before here for the three, case, three examples, which is the signature plot uh, and the size specific energy. But he, he's also looking at other methods, such as license method, uh, which uses uh, the squared P80 in the uh, X axis, and also the fractals method, uh, which you might be familiar with, uh, as uh, Grant has been publishing uh, a lot in this uh, topic. So the fractals method, uh, it allows us to also identify if there is um, some issues uh, with, uh, with the test, because um, the, the, the fractal of each cycle, uh, of each cycle product uh, should be relatively constant over the, the, the whole test work. 
So Julian um, identified that uh, the bias in regrind test work using uh, these different technologies and procedures results in a challenging um, uh, selection of regrind design parameters. And this is a particular uh, uh, more significant uh, for greenfield projects. Going to the design of the circuits. So over the years, a lot of uh, initiatives uh, for improved energy efficiency in comminution have been implemented by the industry. Mine to mill programs where, when we optimize uh, blast design, reconcentration such as uh, ore sorting, dense media separation, or preferential grade deportment, which I um, actually worked uh, uh, quite a bit on, on the last one during my PhD when uh, the CRC or program was looking at grade engineering. The classification efficiency, uh, which Juan Ho is pretty familiar with, uh, comparison between cyclones and high frequency screens, um, the benefits in terms of reduced circulating loads and uh, potential uh, upside for throughput. And of course, HPGRs, which can deliver um, much higher energy efficiency than um, sag based circuits. They can produce micro cracks and reduce uh, energy requirements downstream. So all of those are, are, are pretty common uh, uh, measures uh, by the industry now in the past. But uh, researchers was also, were also looking at uh, other options to further improve that energy efficiency. For instance, uh, Walter and, and Jankovic, they, in 2002, they were um, uh, suggesting that uh, coupling HPGR and vertimils would result in, in a better energy efficiency. Joe Pease in 2007 suggested that isomil could be uh, potentially receiving feeds from SAG mills or HPGR circuits. But Peace, uh, 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 in his work, he already alerted that because of uh, the feed size uh, or the product size from SAG mill and HPGR products, there could be the need for a bow mill in stage between uh, uh, that primary crushing grinding circuit and, and the isomill circuit. So nowadays, incorporating these type of steered mills uh, in comminution flow sheets either in secondary or tertiary milling duties is becoming increasingly popular. One circuit that is very popular is the Morency. Um, it includes uh, an HPGR circuit, uh, which is depicted in the figure to the left. Um, that circuit, um, the HPGR receives a scalp feed, truncated feed, and operates in closed circuit with a, a screen. Both the, the product from the first screen and the product of the second screen from the closed circuit oh, report um, to the downstream VTM circuit. To date, we haven't seen any data from Morency that proves that uh, an HPGR VTM circuit is any better than an HPGR bow mill circuit. A couple of other examples include Bongo. Uh, uh, the image is a bit faint, but uh, this circuit is a typical SAG pebble crushing circuit, followed by uh, Vertimil in closed circuit with cyclones. When I analyzed the Bongo data, uh, we could see some benefits in terms of energy efficiency, efficiency of the secondary uh, milling circuit uh, compared to a bow mill circuit. Now, another example, it's a bit different. Um, we, in, at Santa Elena in Mexico, they had a three-stage crushing bow mill circuit and they uh, fitted a HIG mill in tertiary duty. Uh, that circuit was, is very successful and uh, I understand that uh, they are actually even installing a second HIG mill to further push throughput. There are many other uh, uh, applications, similar applications in in the literature, which is listed that uh, on the bottom left. So as uh, Peace alerted in 2007, um, 
coarser feeds can have an effect on energy efficiency. Uh, Monong Huang, who was an engineer that I worked with uh, in 2018, uh, he gathered uh, data from the public domain on VTM circuits, and uh, he compared the energy efficiency of um, of the data of the circuits he was analyze, analyzing based on the bond work index. So if you compare the actual circuit efficiency to what bond work index would um, uh, the, the ratio between um, the measured and the bond work index uh, value, we can see that uh, the energy efficiency decreases linearly with the feed size. So the coarser the feed, the lower the energy efficiency. However, <clears throat> when we are feeding those fine feeds to a bond uh, test, they are non-standard feeds. So a uh, question is raised on whether this is uh, realistic or if we should be correcting that bond work index to determine what is the uh, actual uh, uh, factor there, an efficiency, efficiency factor. More recently, um, coarse particle flotation has emerged as an enabler uh, for a potential step change in, in energy consumption in grinding circuits. And that's because you can uh, grind coarser so there is a lower energy consumption and lower operating costs in the comminution circuit. It allows uh, uh, coarser waste uh, to, to be rejected. And also it can be stored separately to save uh, tailing storage capacity. And it can also um, deliver improved water and tailings management. So in this slide, I show uh, an example of a typical brownfield uh, CPF uh, flow sheet. So um, tailings from the conventional rougher flotation is normally fed to CPF cyclones to remove fines that uh, negatively uh, affect the coarse particle flotation performance. Uh, the product, the concentrate from the particle, uh, uh, coarse particle flotation circuit uh, goes through normal uh, uh, dewatering cyclone, removing fines that are low grade that entrain into the concentrate. And actually, if you use a, a third mill in, in CPF regrind duty, you can directly feed the mill with that underflow because the density of that material is already adequate for feeding the mill. So you don't need to operate the circuit as a typical ball mill in closed circuit with the cyclones. That in this example here, the CPF uh, uh, regrind mill delivers a PAD of uh, around 80 microns, and that's combined uh, with, uh, with the rougher concentrate and goes to the existing regrind and cleaner flotation circuit. So when designing that regrind mill, a few challenges occur. So as you can see to the graph on the right, uh, the CPF, and the dewatering cyclone underflows, they, they have very similar P80, but the curves are really different. The quantity of fines is really different. So there is a significant change on the slope of the particle size distribution curve. And using P80, like a single point, uh, cannot be used for uh, mill sizing purposes. So we run uh, some tests to, to understand uh, uh, what is the effect of uh, these fines, right? Normally when uh, you are um, designing these circuits, you will uh, conduct some CPF uh, flotation and generate uh, some sample to be submitted to the regrind circuit. And mimicking the, the watering process in lab can be challenging. So in this project uh, that I'm showing here on the right, we run two different tests actually three different tests. First, we just took the CPF concentrate and run a jar mill test and a Higg mill test. So these results are shown here in these two parallel curves. So in this case, we didn't see the consistent bias that we saw in the other three examples that I showed before. But the third test, we used the scalp feed. So we removed the fines before running the regrind test. And what we observed is that um, the curve is pretty parallel uh, to that uh, obtained with the unscalp feed. Uh, but the interesting result uh, was that by removing 30% of the mass, uh, the energy required was 30% lower. 
So that suggests that uh, trying to mimic the, the watering uh, stage in lab is not required. So going into uh, what is the approach uh, to design circuits, right? Typically in the last decades, uh, the focus is uh, on selecting technologies that are suitable for the duty. So it can handle the feed size characteristic. It can deliver the target grind size and it achieves a high energy efficiency. So focus is on energy consumption, right? Um, then you, uh, conduct an economic analysis where you come up with operating costs, capital costs, and one will choose uh, the, the technology that delivers the best financial outcome for the project. This approach, however, only considers the direct energy and consumables cost. It does not include all the environmental metrics. So looking into uh, uh, what could be done differently uh, with an ESG approach. So the approach uh, would be focusing on minimizing environmental impact. So you want to reduce energy consumption as we always have, but you will also uh, include other metrics such as water consumption and the emissions of greenhouse gases. So this new approach uh, integrates uh, the sustainability metrics into economic evaluations because it includes all the indirect emissions from construction and operation of the plants. Uh, Greg Lane presented a webinar at AUSIMM this year where he um, indicated that the emissions associated with construction of a processing plant is equivalent to seven to 10 weeks of steel media consumption. So that indicates that the operation of these circuits is, uh, has a much higher influence on, on the emissions. Uh, so coming up with the construction emissions is only a small portion of the whole picture. So Alsenko has been using an approach that is based on uh, the United States Environmental Protection Agency guidance. Uh, they classify emissions uh, in three scopes. Scope one is the direct emissions uh, from controlled uh, sources, which typically is the same uh, for all scenarios. Uh, but scope two and three are different. So scope two is the indirect uh, gas, greenhouse emissions associated with power consumption. And scope three is the indirect emissions associated with construction, which includes the, the contract and steel required to build the plant, and in operations, which includes the consumables and also their transportation. So looking into the main consum consumables in a regrind circuit, which is the grinding media. Um, we started looking at uh, what are the emissions associated with the steel media, with steel media. So manufacturing steel media is uh, a very energy intensive process because it includes the refinement and the smelting of, uh, <clears throat> of the feeds. So emissions can fluctuate a lot. Uh, the carbon emission intensity associated uh, with blast furnace, for instance, is much higher than direct reduction. So the steel making process is very important. The media production process is also important because um, casting requires much more energy than forging. And also casting can use recycled scrap steel, which would uh, result in, in a much lower overall emissions. So for, the case, for this study, we used uh, information generated by the World Steel Council uh, which uh, indicates that uh, the average uh, uh, emissions associated with production of steel is 1.84 tons of CO2 per ton of, of steel. So this is an average number. And of course, each operation would have to uh, look at uh, their sources and how it, the manufacturing process is, is done. So selection of uh, uh, your uh, vendors is, is, would play a big role in, in this ESG approach. 
<clears throat> now, emissions intensity associated with ceramic uh, can be uh, lower than steel because it requires a much lower energy inputs for the refinement and sintering. So the process is a bit different. Again, the emissions um, can vary in a very wide range. Problem is, uh, most figures that you can find in the public domain are, are mostly uh, associated with construction. So sanitary products, tiles, fittings. Um, there is no detailed information uh, specific to grinding media. So Sam Crane and Grant Valentine did great work there in preparing a more detailed analysis that is focused on, on grinding media. They interacted with a few uh, ceramic media vendors and they estimated what is uh, the natural gas and electricity required to produce ceramic media. And they came up with uh, a value uh, of one ton of CO2 per ton of ceramic, which is almost half of that for steel. Now, transportation is a, another important factor there because um, uh, the emissions will depend on the distance and, and the mode of transportation. And depending on, on where your providers are, uh, the trans transportation related emissions could assume a very important magnitude. So for example, uh, according to the US EPA, uh, trains can uh, deliver uh, uh, 10 times less uh, emissions uh, than diesel trucks. I'm going to go through uh, a small case study. So this case study was a regrind stage, so it was not a course duty application, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, uh, it's an existing gold processing plant uh, processing uh, flotation concentrate. And they were looking at expanding the circuit. So an existing bowl mill circuit would be replaced by either a larger bowl mill or uh, a more energy efficient uh, uh, stirred mill. The objective of this case study was to develop uh, a greenhouse gas emissions inventory for each of these uh, technologies uh, so that we could compare uh, the embedded uh, the, the emissions of this um, of these circuits. So on to the right, uh, we can see the main design criteria that was used for the circuit design. So feed size of 150 micron and product size of 25 micron. The specific energy from the bowl mill was benchmarked against the operation. And the, the specific energy required for stirred mills was based on um, a few uh, signature plots obtained uh, for uh, samples collected at the plant. We assume that uh, Verde mills and Hig mills would uh, achieve similar uh, energy efficiency for the purpose of this case study. We also benchmarked the media consumption uh, in the existing bow mill circuit, and we back calculated uh, what the abrasion index would be and um, came up with that. Uh, very low value there. So what are the main inputs for uh, uh, estimating scopes two and three uh, indirect emissions? So we used uh, in this case, for this case study, because it was located in Canada, we used a very low uh, uh, emissions for the electrical energy. Um, just for reference, uh, if this study was in, in Australia, that value would be about five times higher. Um, we use the steel and ceramic media uh, uh, emissions that I mentioned before. And um, we considered that the media would be transported by diesel trucks and the distance of transportation was a thousand kilometers. So another, another challenge there was uh, to estimate the media consumption for the Verde mill and the Hig mill. So we involved vendors in those discussions. And as shown in the table below, uh, the Verde mill uh, specific consumption of media would be about two thirds of the bowl mill. And the VRM Hig mill, which uses ceramic media would be about half of the Verde mill. 
And as I mentioned before, the regrind power for the vertimu and the higmu was assumed to be the same. So on this graph to the right here, we can see that um, scope two emissions are much higher than scope three. So scope two is the electrical uh, energy, which is their dark blue bars. Um, and uh, uh, scope three is uh, the media consumption and the media transportation, uh, which I chose really bad colors, sorry, uh, but they are very low compared to the other emissions. So the ball mill has the highest GHG emissions from energy consumption, media consumption, and of course, because you consume more media transportation. Uh, we can see that the influence of media material and emissions um, is uh, significant as well. So for the vertimil, uh, where we use uh, steel media, we get a much higher uh, uh, emissions than for the heat mill with the ceramic media. So that means that uh, stirred milling using ceramic media results in the lowest environmental impact. Of course, in, in this study, we didn't uh, consider, for instance, the use of uh, recycled materials for production of steel media. That would uh, give a twist uh, uh, to this uh, outcome. And that's all for today. All right, thank you, Bianca. I'll now open the floor up to any questions that we have. Thanks, Bianca. Great chat um, and raised a couple of, I guess, issues that the industry needs to address. Probably the biggest one to me that stood out is um, the disconnect between energy consumption for coarse feed applications where you showed that graph where the energy and regrind basically approaches bond and the finer F80 cases where you're grinding to very fine sizes where there's a big um, energy saving, you know, 35, maybe even 40%. Uh, how do you think the industry needs to go about addressing that issue with the equipment suppliers and engineering firms? It's, it's a challenge, right, that we are facing nowadays. Uh, I think with more and more circuits being installed, I guess benchmarking is our main resource. Uh, as I mentioned for Morency, we haven't seen uh, much of a benefit, but for uh, the other circuit, Bongo, we saw 10 to 15% reduction. So I think uh, to address this issue, we need to evaluate uh, what needs to be done uh, to actually deliver a higher energy efficiency, perhaps like you, we need to try and reach uh, a, a top size that will not negatively affect uh, uh, the, the energy efficiency. The other uh, path is adapting our start milling technologies for these coarser duty applications, which is what uh, STM is currently doing. They are redesigning their circuits, uh, their mill to allow larger media to be fed to allow coarser material to be properly fed to the mill. And, and that uh, is the type of initiative that I would expect from different vendors uh, uh, to allow that higher energy efficiency to be achieved. Cool. We have an online question from Grant Ballantyne. Uh, great technical presentation, Bianca. On a more personal note, I'm interested if there is any advice you would give to the PhD students in the audience who are considering a role in an engineering design company based on your personal experience. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's a tricky question. Um, come talk to me personally and I'll, I'll, I'll give you some tips. <laughs> Actually, if you do have interest in working in an engineering company, do come and talk to me. <laughs> well, my note on that is that it's been fantastic to see people going from the JK into various engineering companies and how they've blossomed. So I'll give that advice to, to people here. It's an amazing opportunity to develop your skills and turn people like Grant from only thinking academically into doing applied stuff. <laughs> 
<laughs> but underpinned by an understanding of the science. And I think that's the important thing to take with you. Which kind of leads into my question, comment. It's actually quite a complex presentation, which you've flown over various bits, but there's a lot of complexity sitting underneath what you've done. And uh, at least eight years ago, we tried to launch a program with the various suppliers of a, a method of a characterizing wall breakage at fine sizes. They didn't want a bar of it. They didn't want to be near us. They all wanted their secret test. So quite interesting. You must probably be still facing that. And nowhere in your presentation is an independent test method. But that still stares at us as an industry. And I think it's actually the, the companies need to drive it. Suppliers are not going to. They see it as somehow secret. Um, but then you talk about the sorry. A comment on that one. Yeah. Senko has been uh, working closely with vendors and there is appetite to understand the issues because they deal with these issues like on a daily basis. And I guess they also want to resolve it <laughs> or at least come to a conclusion why the differences are there. Maybe have a slightly more cynical view. <laughs> that the, um, uh, exactly on that point, they want to go coarser, they want to do harder stuff. And all the vendors I see from the earliest ones to the most recent, just keep throwing stuff in the mill and see what happens at a pilot level and say, well, what will happen at a lab level? Uh, sorry, a lab, then a pilot, then let's see in operation. Yet we have this most amazing fine grinding theory of quad A, which is the stress energy relationship. And I think the problem is no one can do maths, so they don't want to do it. It's just phenomenal. It will predict that those mills will fail or not fail. And it's about the minimum, the minimum energy required to break a particle for a given stress. And as you go coarser particles, they need a higher total energy. Therefore, their stress energy is dropping, won't break it. So you need bigger balls, higher intensity, uh, or a softer ore. So it can be calculated, but for some reason, the industry is avoiding it. So I brought quite into mineral processing to bring it in. I've clearly failed to get it into the industry. Maybe you guys can succeed and actually do the maths. So the maths is out there. We need someone to basically lead it, I suppose. And I haven't succeeded in leading it. We, we tried here when Sam was with us to get that into the field and really have not managed to penetrate. But at the, just to repeat it, the science is out there to actually design it. And it's worked on for different equipment what the stress intensity distribution is. So I beg the industry to take up the science that's actually there. <laughs> so that's a rather complicated comment, but it buried in it a number of questions. Maybe we need to have a coffee with Julian and uh, he can do the groundwork. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Ben. Time. So it's a good presentation. So just a comment. <clears throat> When we are talking about cost grinding duty in uh, sturt milling, uh, okay, Mo in most of the cases, we are looking at 80% passing. All the mill sizings are, they are done at 80% passing. But uh, what is more crucial is from the 80% to the uh, 99 or even 100%, okay, that uh, long tail. Even like, for example, the example that uh, you showed uh, from I think in one of the sites in Africa where Metro installed the SAC and uh, VTM, Bungao, uh, Bungao. That was presented in SAC 2018. Yep. So uh, I think the, the critical point in this particular design is to look at from 80% to 100% passing. Okay, you will see this long tail and whether the technology chosen, okay, whether the technology chosen is sufficient to grind those cost particles because at 80 percent passing uh, if it's something coming around uh, out from side if, if it's a one millimeter or even two millimeters or like a few if it's an egg if it's a few hundred microns uh, like for example four to eight hundred microns those it can grind but those cost particles those will be the build up in in the mill okay then these are the critical points and this is the reason why like for example metso or us we limit the top size at six millimeters Okay, that is one point. 
And also, I think in one of the slides, you mentioned that Joe Pace mentioned that uh, they need a ball mill in between the sack to Isamil. Okay. I think this is the main reason why he mentioned that because the ability to of the high speed mills to to break the coarser particles between the eighty percent to hundred percent, I think this is the critical part, and this is what I what we found as well uh, when we are doing uh, test and also during even uh, during operations, and that is the reason why in and when we supply the mills for cost grinding duty, we evaluate whether to have the cost classifier or not within the mill. Okay, there is an attachment called cost classifier, and this design has been there since like 40, 50 years ago when we start supplying the mill. Because when Nippon started supplying the mill, it was basically for the limestone application of uh, minus 10 millimeters, and the bond work index was about 12 to 13 kilowatt hour per ton. And at that time, we supplied that. But when we moved to mining application to regrind duty, then we start supplying the cost classifier. But now when we are going back to the cost of grind duty in mining, then yes, we are start supplying that. So all those things, the small, small things need to be, how to say, taken into consideration during the mill design and also the circuit design. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the reminder, because uh, from the top of my head, uh, the bongo circuit, uh, that screen uh, has a finer aperture than Morency. And I think that's the reason why bongo shows a bit of a energy efficiency compared to a bow mill and Morency doesn't. Even though that's not public data, <laughs> that's what we think so far. So you can see some, some differences. Like we don't have the graph, but you can see that the graph that you thought is correct. Uh, you have the, oh, the, the uh, one that is correct. So, the moment you go closer, the efficiency, so the moment you go closer, the efficiency will you will not see the typical efficiency that uh, being claimed uh, 30 to 35 percent. No, okay, but you will see some efficiency. But uh, as you mentioned in your presentation, there are other how to say advantages as well, as well uh, in terms of footprint and all that, and also media consumption, okay, compared to the ball mill. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. We got another online question. So, Mahmoud was asking, did you conduct any surveys to estimate the population balance model parameters of stirred milling? I haven't myself specifically for this work, but I think that question is for Sam. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a, uh, another online question from Jesse Ting. So how do you compare the uh, VTM as magnetic liner to enable media to protect shell liner? versus other ceramic mill that have a limited ability to do that. Um, how does the high media, how is the higher media consumption discounted from this uh, advantages? For this case study, it was a really high level comparison and I didn't go through that level of detail. And normally when we are doing conceptual studies, uh, we actually don't go uh, to that level of detail, but if something that we could investigate in the future. Call me, send me an email. Let's talk about it. Um, this might be a bit vague, this question, but you're looking at there's the cost of energy versus um, greenhouse gas emissions as well. Uh, with how um, carbon emissions are priced, uh, is it like, is there a significant, like, is there a way that you can see this feeding through into financial models into how people actually choose one mill over another um, based on carbon output. And, um, you know, is, is that actually significant in the economics based on the cost of carbon versus just the cost of electricity? So I think that there are different views. Um, some people, um, and, and it's something we've been discussing a lot uh, uh, amongst ourselves in Nusenko, uh, uh, can we actually account for that in financial uh, analysis? So some people think no, because uh, carbon prices are, uh, are so volatile or um, could have a lot of variations. And so investors 
um, would be kind of like blindsided if you included that uh, into an economical analysis. Other things that uh, uh, nowadays we already can predict what that will be, and, and we should because it has a value attributed to it. So I don't think there is a, a, a standard uh, in the industry yet for that. I guess it needs to mature a little bit further, but uh, that doesn't uh, mean we cannot do it uh, and, and compare. So typically when we do it, we, we show the basic traditional approach and we show the upside or, or the downside of including the emissions. And actually, this is a very topical question because uh, Grant will be presenting on this on uh, the SAG conference this year. The metrics you had up on your slide, on your one of your slides, there that we're looking at capital costs, water, and energy. I think this, those are the three main parameters that are current and going to remain current for a while. And places like South America, water is even even more important. Um, Canada, the cost of power is five to six cents a kilowatt hour, so that's not hugely important, but in water management is. Just while I've got the phone, um, the, <laughs> oh, the microphone. Um, another metric is the capital intensity. So you mentioned about the, they're looking at scaling up the, the um, fine, ultra-fine mills. So where's the industry at? now and if Sam wants to put his two cents worth and he can do that but what we're, we're, how big can they go and what might be the limitations in in shell um, mechanics so right now to my knowledge the biggest uh, third meal available is um, uh, six and a half uh, ki thousand kilowatts uh, and uh, vertical uh, hick mill yeah and there is a, a quite large M, M50,000, the ISA mill. Can't tell you from the top of my head what the power is, but it hasn't been installed. And I haven't found a client that has appetite for that yet. I, I don't see a reason why they cannot go to eight or, or nine, right? Like normally sag mill, bull mills, they are limited to uh, the size of the mill head that you can cast. Uh, I don't think the diameter of these mills are, are, are would cause any uh, issues. So I think it's more about, uh, uh, you know, uh, understanding the stresses and, and limitations to which point the... the Feed grains of crop to all the mines that's, that's reducing, then the little feed throughputs increase. So that the downstream effects that we get in the cost down around the business end, around the concentrate and liberation state areas. Yeah, just on that, the, I don't think it's a mechanical issue, it's an energy distribution issue. So the flow of the material inside, it, everyone's pushing it up empirically where you understand where, you, where your energy gets distributed inside. It's only in a limited zone. So there's going to be a fall off that the zone stays the same size. So that the, there's a decreasing benefit, but that needs something like DEM work to look at more carefully. So I think actually that's the critical factor. But just weighing into this fire, the screening size, the top size, and I'd really like to see this in the studies. You've, you've brought it out, it drops off as you go coarser. So the efficiency approaches the ball mill. And as Sam says, it's all about the very coarse end. It's only the top 15% that matters. PAD has got nothing to do with it. And that's all a fine screen. So our friend Yoga here can help you with a fine screen. It doesn't have to be 100 micron, it can be a one millimeter, two millimeter. So take that SAG screen you're seeing, if you've got a fine. Uh, finer stirred mill. To me, it's basically a no-brainer to put a finer screen ahead of that and sculpt it because the sag mills are actually very good at grinding that stuff. We forget how good sag mills are at grinding one, uh, one to 10 millimeter. Send it back to the sag mill. So I think that'd be a very interesting one to look for applications like that. And ones that are failing, that's the suggestion. Put it in a measure and you can do an on-off test. 
So if we can persuade a company to put it in that's not doing that well with it and do an on-off test, fine screen on, off, on, off, we can measure it. So there's my suggestion for the day. <laughs> All right. Well, if there are no further questions for Bianca, please join me in thanking her for her presentation. So next week we'll have uh, Mark Drexler from CBSM Mining Services. He's going to be talking about a new gyratory rolls crusher, which they're developing in its commercialization pathway. And also in four weeks time, uh, we're we'll having a special session of the seminars, to, uh, which will be dedicated to Alvin Lynch. So please keep that date for in your calendars. Thank you.